Welcome to this wonderful space where I can welcome you on behalf of the Nanovig Institute for European Studies and of course also on behalf of the Snight Museum. My name is Clement Sednak and I serve as director of the Nanovig Institute with its mission to build bridges between Europe and Notre Dame, between Americans and Europeans. We wish to thank the Snight Museum of Art and its staff for hosting today's lecture for opening their doors to us on a Monday, when they are typically closed, in addition to it being the first day of classes, which is a new experience here for all of us on campus in Notre Dame. We especially wish to thank this night's director, Joe Becker, his assistant, Laura Reef, and their registrar, Victoria Perdomo, who helped organize the special exhibit of Austrian artwork on display in the second floor in the Beardsley Gallery, as well as the decorative arts exhibit with Austrian works on the first floor. Please see the printed exhibit programs that you have seen on your seats, and around the corner, you could see the objects after this event. So a big thank you to our hosts. If this were a liturgy, I would say, peace be with you. Even though it's not a liturgy, I would like to say, peace be with you. As we commemorate the US-Austria Peace Treaty after the First World War, a treaty that was signed on August 24, 1921. So tomorrow, it will be exactly 100 years. Peace is not something we can take for granted, as the most recent developments in Afghanistan taught us once again. Peace is a gift and a responsibility. In German, Friede ist Gabe und Aufgabe. On Thursday last week, we organized a virtual symposium on the us austria Peace Treaty from 1921, exploring aspects of the complexity of the text and its impact. Last week's event, as well as today's event, have been made possible through the support of the Botsteber Foundation. The Botsteber Foundation was established to promote an understanding of the historic relationship between the United States and Austria. It was founded by Dietrich Botsteber, who was born in Austria and had to emigrate when the Nazis took power in Austria. He settled in the United States to pursue an exceptionally successful career in technical development. He remained connected to Austria and also founded the Botsteber Institute for Austrian American Studies that publishes the Journal of Austrian American History. So a lot of Austrian America coming up here, right? A big thank you to the Botsteber Foundation for helping us remember the 1921 US-Austria Peace Treaty. A peace treaty is a milestone in the relationship between two countries, and we are grateful for the many years of peaceful relations between the US and Austria. The most important Austrian diplomat in the US who supports these peaceful relations is our guest today. It is my pleasure and my honor to introduce our guest of honor who came to sunny South Bend this afternoon, His Excellency Ambassador Martin Weiss, the Ambassador of Austria to the United States. Welcome, Your Excellency. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I love Notre Dame. They never disappoint. <laughs> Ambassador Weiss was born in Innsbruck. His father was a well-known professor of German studies who remains an influential voice in the area of Austrian literature. Having successfully survived a childhood in the household of a university professor, our guest of honor started his career in the Austrian Foreign Service in 1990. He has held some delicate diplomatic missions and posts. Previous to his appointment as Austrian ambassador to the US, Martin Weiss served as ambassador to Israel, as director of the press and information department of the foreign ministry, and as ambassador to Cyprus yet to show his deep diplomatic skills in zones, in zones of conflict. Ambassador Weiss is no stranger to the US. Throughout his career, he held several postings in the United States. He started as a human rights attaché for the Austrian mission to the United Nations in New York, held the positions of political counselor, counselor for congressional affairs and public diplomacy, and later director of the Austrian Press and Information Service at the Austrian Embassy in Washington, DC and most recently served as Austrian Consul General in Los Angeles from 2004 to 2009. We can assume that Ambassador Weiss has flown over Indiana and our university many times. We are grateful and honored that you have landed in the Midwest today to your first visit to Notre Dame. 
Ambassador Weiss holds a law degree equivalent to a JD from the University of Vienna and an LLM from the University of Virginia. He is married and the father of two. Ambassador Weiss took his duties, took up his duties as head of mission in Washington, D.C. On, them, on November 1st, 2019. He may have enjoyed a few pre-pandemic months, but ever since spring 2020, his work has been shaped by the global health challenges that, has, that have hit us all. And here we are. Ambassador Weiss will speak for about 30 minutes on the topic, Transatlantic Relations and Austrian Perspective, 1921 to 2021. And after his talk, Ambassador Weiss graciously agreed to a Q&A session where we hope for some comments and footnotes and questions ever so politely. And afterwards, the Nanowick Institute for European Studies will invite you all to a reception um, in the first floor to celebrate the presence of the ambassador, to honor the peace treaty, and to kick off our academic year. Your Excellencies, thank you so much for being here. The floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Zedmark said I could take off my mask during my, during my speech, so thank you very much. That's kind of a relief. Thank you for this, this, this kind introduction. Uh, yeah, it's, it's great to have stopped here. You, you're perfectly right. I, I flew over Indiana a, a number of times, so it's great to be here. Notre Dame always, well, in the back of my mind, I always knew Notre Dame, the Fighting Irish, great university. But for the first time, I had a chance to see the campus, which is, of course, outstanding. But I don't have to tell you that you, you all know why you are here at this, at this great university and school. Um, I promise to give a, a, a talk about transatlantic relations starting in the year uh, 1921. And uh, tomorrow, it's exactly 100 years uh, that uh, this is the Austrian Legal Gazette, where the, the, the state, the, the peace treaty was published at the time. Uh, and 100 years is a, is a good chunk of, of history. Um, when, you, when you read some of the comments that were made at the time, one I, I thought was kind of striking, and this is the one here. It might be a little hard to read, but it says that this peace treaty was adopted, is adopted here today. It was not a harsh dictate as opposed to other peace treaties, apparently. But it was a result of negotiations between two equal partners. There is the hope that this peace of Vienna can be the starting point of a new, more fortunate epoch in our political and economic development. Well, let me fast forward 100 years. Uh, this is uh, uh, the export between Austria uh, and uh, the most important exports of Austria. And you will see the United States is the second most uh, important export market for Austrian products. First, of course, is Germany. Um, a large neighbor, but the United States is already a number two uh, larger than our uh, important neighbors like Italy and Switzerland. So a uh, hundred years after the, the treaty of uh, the peace treaty of Vienna, here we look at our economic relationships, with, which is extremely strong. And just to put it in, in numbers here, uh, you see that our export to the United States within 10 years has pretty much doubled which is not nothing, uh, you might imagine. Uh, we see a little dip in the year 2020. Uh, this is, of course, a COVID dip. Uh, but uh, I'm quite sure that in the year 2021 and the years following, we will uh, increase the numbers yet, hopefully doubling them in the next uh, 10 years. Um, just a few figures when it comes to Austria and the United States. We have a lot of foreign direct investment in the United States. Approximately 200 100 Austrian companies have production sites in the US. Those companies employ 30,000 workers in the US. The other way around, it's pretty much the same picture, American companies in Austria. Uh, if you wonder what are the Austrians exporting to the United States, there is no Austrian Philips or Austrian Daimler-Benz or Austrian Nestle. Austria is a country of small and medium-sized companies. Um, so when it says cars and car parts, there are no Austrian BMWs. However, if you open the hood of your BMW, the engine was most likely produced in Austria. So Austria is very much in, in this niche where we produce a lot of products that you don't know about, uh, but they're very much Austrian. Um, 
Uh, just to give you a, a few examples of names that you might have heard, well, BMW, it has a, lar a large production site, as I said, for engines in, 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 in Steyr. Uh, KTM is an Austrian motorcycle maker. Actually, they have taken on the big, big ones, the last MotoGP. Any of you is a fan of motorcycle racing? Um, KTM won the race ahead of uh, the, the likes of uh, Yamaha and uh, and uh, the huge giants of motorcycles. Uh, KTM is now competing at that level. Red Bull is a drink you might have used for your studies every once in a while. Uh, uh, produced and, and developed in Austria. Uh, Glock handguns, you know, it's like I'm not a great fan of handguns, but if you have one, then it should probably be a Glock. Uh, and uh, uh, Rosenbauer is, it produces special uh, engines for, for firefighting at airports. And just a few examples of, of uh, products uh, made in Austria. Uh, foreign direct investment, uh, if you look at the United States, one of our largest investments is a, a steel production plant by First Alpine in Corpus Christi, Texas. This is investment of uh, roughly a billion euro, uh, took place a, a few years uh, ago. Uh, another one is Red Bull, uh, again in Arizona. Uh, f until now, every can of Red Bull that you drank had been bottled and filled in Austria and shipped across the, the Atlantic. Not extremely uh, environmentally friendly, I would suppose. Um, now this changes, and this is a production plant where Red Bull will, cans will now be produced and filled in the United States, 3.5 billion cans will be produced at this very plant, another big investment. Uh, Ega, the gentleman with the red jacket and the helmet, is, that's me. I visited the, the, the firm because they have uh, invested uh, roughly 700 billion euro in the in production. Um, it's a company that really came out of World War II, because after World War II, you uh, needed a lot of uh, production for building houses, but you didn't have a lot of wood, but you had a lot of uh, destroyed houses with wood pieces in them. So basically, they developed the technology to take the wood, to shred the wood, and to produce laminated wood out of these pieces. Now, of course, they, have, they do it to... Uh, all kinds of, pers uh, of uh, perfection you can do in our bathrooms and kitchens and whatnot. Uh, and it's a company that really operates worldwide and has now a, a pretty large facility. Again, it's a, almost a billion uh, dollars investment in Lexington, North Carolina. Um, and the last kind of an economic slide, uh, well, basically, this is a GDP per capita in Austria, and we are now uh, at... at pretty much $55,000. There are two uh, uh, problems in the slide. That's 2008, that's the European debt crisis. And of course, 2020, that's this COVID. Uh, but, but other than that, it's of course, uh, the line goes up, up, up. Um, but for those of you who, who, who look closely, uh, the line starts in 1960. Um, now between 1921 and 1960, I think some things happened. Uh, I, I give you uh, uh, just a few uh, historical data that are important years in, in Austrian history. Uh, 1938, the year of the Anschluss, uh, that's the year basically where Austria ceased to exist. Austria became the Ostmark. Um, there is a pretty strong historic debate in Austria that started mostly in, in the 80s about uh, was Austria a victim or was it not a victim? Actually, this photo kind of uh, displays it a little bit. You see in the background some people who raised their hands to the Hitler goals, so they were kind of happy to see German troops coming into Austria, and that was certainly true for a number of Austrians. Uh, the government was not so happy. They tried to resist, but Austria was not Poland. No shots were fired in 1938. Uh, well, as a great number of Austrians, a couple of days later, uh, ended in, in jails and concentration camps. But also there was a great uh, part of the population who saw this as very much the future for Austria. So it was certainly a, a, a wrong uh, presentation to kind of uh, present it themselves as victims only. That is certainly not the truth. But I think we have had this debate and uh, there has been a very open and frank uh, stock taking of Austria's history. Um, 
Well, 1945, uh, the war is over. Those are the famous photo of the four men in a jeep. Uh, Vienna was a divided city. There were four zones, the, the French, the British, the Americans, and the Russians. Um, and Austria itself was divided. Uh, you see here the, the different uh, zones. Uh, my hometown is Innsbruck and Salzburg, more Salzburg. My father was teaching in Salzburg, and uh, Salzburg was, of course, in the American sector, uh, and you see the other sectors. Uh, and Vienna, as I said, was a divided city among the four. Um, well, about the four men in the Jeep, about three of them, we were quite sure that they would leave Austria at a certain point in time. About the fourth one, we were not quite so sure. Uh, and the problem was that the, the Russian, the Soviet zone, was in the, all the way on the east of Austria. And it, this was adjacent to the Iron Curtain. Very easily could Austria have been a divided country uh, and have seen the, the fate of, of Germany. Um, were it not for, well... Uh, genius, uh, luck, uh, whatever it was, uh, but it was, uh, uh, yeah, uh, before I go there, uh, uh, but in the, in, the, in the time between 45 uh, and 55, that's how long it took until Austria became independent Austria again, uh, I have to mention uh, a plan that you all know, the, the ERP, European Recovery Program, the Marshall Fund, the Marshall Plan. Uh, when I grew up in Salzburg, we used to go swimming at the Eierbad. I don't think that many of my friends knew what the Eierbad was named for. It was the American Youth Association, Eierbad, still used uh, today. Um, and it was presented by the, uh, by the general of the American forces in, in Salzburg as a gift to the Austrian youth in 1950. So paid for by the, by the money of the Marshall Plan uh, in, in, in Austria. Um, and this is not a small feat when you Im imagine that until 1955 there was a war led against Austria, well, Austria, not Austria, technically speaking, but definitely Austria was part of the, of the Third Reich. So in that sense, there was a war. Five years later, you get a, a swimming pool paid for by the, American, by the United States of America. Now, that is uh, something that is uh, actually quite stunning. Uh, hydropower, Austria to this day has approximately 63% of the Austrian uh, electricity per year is produced by hydropower. This is one of the, the uh, most uh, famous dams, Kapun uh, Dam, uh, which was built again with money from the Marshall Fund. Uh, so this is quite something. Uh, and you know, when we talk about these days about Afghanistan, now this is nation building uh, a few years after a devastating war. Um, Last photo, but this you see, uh, there, well, this was one of the posters uh, of the time uh, talking about the Marshall Plan, the ERP money, and truly it, it was the United States that created and built these new bridges uh, between Europe uh, and the United States. 55, that's the year when Austria regained its independence, its freedom. That's the day of the state treaty. It was shown to the cheering masses in Belvedere uh, Palace. The moment was ripe, it became ripe in 1953. Stalin dies, Khrushchev takes over. There is a moment of a thaw between in, in this in Cold War. Uh, and Austria, smartly at the time, grasps that moment. Uh, Austria could not have joined NATO. The Soviets would never have left Austria to, to just join NATO the next day. But Austria at the time was uh, to be a neutral country uh, uh, built on the model of Switzerland. Not many Austrians knew what that even meant, but it was the price for freedom, so they embraced it uh, uh, graciously. Uh, and Austria was uh, a, a neutral country in the middle of Europe, uh, 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 built on the model of Switzerland. Uh, and if today you would ask an Austrian, if you would ask an Austrian, uh, is Austria a neutral country? I mean, this is a second part of nature. It wasn't in 1955, let me assure you. Um, well, after that, uh, of course, uh, the name of the game is economic development. And really, uh, the decisive day for Austria was 1995, the 
joining the European Union, because that is really what brought Austria strongly into the Western economic camp. And of course, Austria applied to join the European Union in 1989, the year of the fall of the, of the Iron Curtain. Uh, that, so that basically opened up this avenue uh, moved Austria into the European Union and since then, then Austrian foreign politics really is European Union foreign politics. I was still working at the Austrian Embassy in Washington in 1992. That was my first assignment. Austria at the time was not part of the European Union. Now, uh, I can tell you it is a completely different work for an Austrian ambassador as an EU uh, a member country. Um, 1995, fantastically important, but if you look closely, you can see that Austria kind of is not exactly in the center of the European Union. Well, that was remedied a few years later, 2004, the eastward enlargement of the European Union, which really, of course, for Austria was extremely important because it meant that we were where uh, ideologically we always saw ourselves at the very heart and center of Europe. Well, then we really were with this uh, round of enlargement of uh, our eastern neighbors. Transatlantic relations, as I said, uh, now Austrian transatlantic relations are European transatlantic uh, relations. Um, when uh, the United States introduced uh, uh, punitive uh, steel and aluminum tariff as done by President uh, Trump in 2018, um, that immediately has an effect on the transatlantic relations and, of course, on Austria. I showed you the, the, the photo of the steel plant uh, in, in, uh, built in Corpus Christi, Texas. They have lost approximately 200 million euro to these uh, tariffs uh, uh, that were introduced 2018. So, and, you know, that's not exactly pocket change for, 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 for a company. Um, glad to say that we have uh, moved along uh, with uh, President Biden. We are coming now to a kind of a truce situation where we hope that this can be resolved. Steel and aluminum uh, tariffs, not exactly an easy problem to solve because at the end of the day, we are talking about international competition, jobs within the United States. So this is not something that a president, and I'm sure there's no love lost between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, but, uh, but uh, President Biden hasn't done away with those tariffs on the first day in his office. Uh, it is still something that needs some work, but at least we have an avenue of how we can hopefully tackle and solve this question. But I, I guarantee you, to you it won't be easy. Um, Airbus Boeing, uh, an endless discussion between Europe and the United States, pretty much 20 years of discussion with, again, tariffs uh, imposed uh, uh, on both sides of the Atlantic to, uh, to a volume of some $30 billion uh, per year. Uh, again, here we have really come to a truce. For five years, there will not be any tariffs because of the Boeing uh, Airbus dispute. Um, and this is something that we really hope we can work out. And it didn't make any sense to have this kind of dispute and to have this kind of tariffs. At the end of the day, uh, we are allies. We uh, hit each other with punitive damage uh, tariffs. Again, Austrian companies lost millions because of, of, of this dispute. And we are talking about uh, uh, drinks, cheese, machinery, completely unrelated to this kind of dispute. But you know, this is how the way how you, you create pressure. Um, but at the end of the day, we are creating tariffs for each other. Uh, meanwhile, China builds the white body airplanes and sells them with state subsidies all over the world. Uh, so how exactly did that ever make sense? So I'm glad to know that this is something that we're really trying to resolve today. Um, Another issue that is hotly debated between the United States and Europe is uh, the, uh, the question of uh, digital taxes. Uh, Austria has introduced uh, such a tax, uh, much to the dismay of the, of the United States. Uh, France has, other countries have, and the, 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 the concept behind it, of course, is quite simple. Uh, and it has a lot of political pull, um, saying that, well, you have companies 
the Facebooks, Twitters, and others of the world uh, that create a huge stream of revenue in Austria and don't pay a single cent of tax in, into Austrian coffers. Not a single cent. Uh, and of course, Austrian companies will say, how, how, how can that be fair? I'm a medium-sized company, I have to pay all of my taxes, and, and, and they can find a different way around uh, this tax system. Of course, this is making a, a complicated question into something very simple, but the political dynamics are very simple in this. No European politician can simply say, let's say it's nothing, we're all friends here, and let's forget about this stupid tax system. No, 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 no. This is something that has to be discussed, but the good thing is now that it is now being discussed. We not, do not solve this as we had started uh, with, again, introducing tariffs, uh, punitive tariffs among each other, but we hope within the OECD to be able to find a solution that we can all live with on both sides of the Atlantic. Again, not simple for an American president to accept uh, additional taxes on American companies because of revenues they make abroad, because you would always say, well, if anybody taxes my companies, then it's me. But uh, this is a, a complicated question. The devil is in the details, but we are currently, as I speak, working in Paris to find a solution that we can live with on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, of course, um, Again, transatlantic relations, there is one issue that uh, we are all talking about these days, and that's the relationship to China. Uh, this picture, I think, fits quite well because it, it puts Europe in a sandwich position, uh, and that's kind of where we are. Because uh, China for us is, of course, a partner. It's also a competitor, but it's also a huge market. Uh, it's a place where we produce a lot of our goods. Um, and sometimes you read in the media that they talk about, uh, again, we're entering now a, a cold war again uh, with China. But the, the economic relations between the West and the Soviet Union were practically non-existent, except for some raw products, sure enough. But which Soviet product would you find in your household in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s? Chances are zero. Uh, which Chinese product do you find in your household? Chances is definitely not zero. Uh, so the, the, the economic relationship between us and China, the United States and China, is so much stronger that this comparison to the, to the Cold War and the Soviet Union, I think, is a complete fallacy. Um, and just look at the numbers of American companies, GM, sold last year 2.5 million cars in the United States. 2.9 million in China. Same is true for Daimler-Benz, BMW. BMW sells approximately 300,000 cars in the United States, 800,000 cars in China. So the economic cooperation between us and China is so strong. Uh, make no mistake, we can talk about all the onshoring and resourcing in the world. This is a relationship that is strong and lasting. And of course, you can build all the... TVs uh, in Chicago, made in America, but chances are they will be approximately this size and cost probably 10 times as much. I'm not sure how much public support will, there will be for this, but of course, uh, resilience and resourcing are issues that are important for all of us. Um, i just give you one personal example. Uh, BMW, I, I bought a new BMW when I came to the United States, and being a good global citizen, I bought a hybrid version of the car. Um, uh, well, true enough, a month after I bought it, uh, the car didn't work anymore because there was a problem with the battery, so it had to be recalled. Well, BMW cannot repair a, uh, the battery in your car because every single battery that BMW uses, it buys in Korea. So basically, for two and a half months, my car was in, standing still. Mighty BMW is impossible to repair a new car for me. And that, of course, is a question of resilience. And COVID kind of brought it home that there are some issues that we all want to take a hard look at. Uh, and when it comes to pharmaceuticals, to, raw, to uh, rare materials, there are things that we want to look at. And we want to look at those together. And I think the important lesson that we have learned, and nowadays, Europe and the United States sound kind of similar when we talk about China. We have common interests. Uh, 
why is the Chinese market not open for American companies? Why is it not open for European companies? We are definitely ha have uh, joint interests that we can work on together. But I remember vaguely there were sentences issue, uh, spoken in the White House that said, well, you know, the Europeans are just as bad as the Chinese, just a little smaller. Well, I don't think Joe Biden would say that anymore. Uh, I think we have moved on. Uh, and I think rightly so, because there are things that we want to do together. Um, talking about things we want to do together, climate change, of course, today is a huge topic that uh, Europe and the United States are very closely working on. And actually, again, talking about China, where we need China within our boat. Um, but the climate change is a topic that sounds beautiful on the surface. It gets very complicated when you look at the details. Um, carbon adjustment is a, well, it's a nice word. Basically, it means tariffs on products that have not produced as sustainably as your own products. Because why would European companies um, pay all this, basically, taxes in order to produce cleanly just to allow products coming into your market that haven't been produced cleanly. So you have to kind of adjust for this kind of situation. Well, that could lead to a huge conflict between Europe and the United States, because if we introduce punitive tariffs, call them carbon adjustment, on American products that haven't built to be, been built to the same standards as European products, now there you can have a huge discussion. Because as I said, in theory, uh, we are all on the same page. In practice, this is a very complicated discussion. Plus, you know it better than I do, there's, of course, a deep political divide when it comes to this topic. Uh, every poll you look at, ask a Democrat and ask a Republican about climate change, you get two different sets of answers. Um, still the same climate, still the same air, but at the end of the day, there's a huge political divide. Not so strong in Europe. Uh, in Austria, we have a conservative government, a conservative party with a Green Party in the government, so conservatives can meet green demands. You have to go pretty far to the right in Europe to find someone who would basically deny the, the, the topic of climate change, but it is a, it is a politically fraught uh, topic, and it's a very co complicated topic when you look at the details Again, um, nothing can be achieved uh, by Europe alone, by the United States alone. Definitely a, a topic for, for, for uh, cooperation. I said our politics with the United States are, for the most part, European politics. But of course, there are issues where Europe does not have one position. Um, this is the Balkans. Uh, before Croatia had, had joined the European Union. Croatia, of course, now is a member of the European Union. The other states are not. For Austria, this is one of the priorities of our foreign politics that we say we have to bring these countries into the European Union. How on earth does it make any sense that these kind of minor countries, and we are talking five, six, seven million inhabitants per country. And, but these countries are not part of the European Union. Just any country around them is part of the European Union, but those are not. That creates vacuums, and nature and politics abhors a vacuum. That creates playing grounds for Russia, for China, uh, for Turkey, uh, for drug dealers. It creates all kinds of mischief and, and, and negative uh, dynamics. Um, but there is no European joint position on these countries joining the European Union. Rather, what we are doing these days, we are constantly moving the goalposts. The moment one of these countries has achieved the things we ask them for, we'll ask them for something else. Very disappointing for these countries who did that feel very European. And the funny thing is that Austria and the United States have practically an identical position on the Balkans. We are both in favor of having them in the European Union as soon as possible. This has to be the perspective. Uh, and we see eye to eye with the United States like we see with no other European country. Uh, if you follow the debate, for example, in France, there's a lot of hesitation about Kosovo and Albania, as if that were to, stay, to destabilize the European Union. And we have played this game in the European Union. We've brought countries into the European Union that were not quite up at the level of Europe at the day. But it was for all of the countries we brought in, it was a story of success. Uh, 
and why wouldn't we repeat this success? So this is something that we are uh, closely working on with the United States uh, to uh, hopefully find some better answers that we have in the past. Um, another issue that we have uh, a, a discussion with the United States, which has now been resolved, this is a part of the famous North Stream 2 pipeline. Uh, Austria was one of the, of the investors into this pipeline. Uh, our largest energy company invested uh, 1.5 billion euros in building this pipeline. You've read about it. This is a big debate between uh, the United States and Europe. We have basically come to a, to a conclusion that this pipeline will be built. Uh, for Austria, this was always uh, very much a, an energy question. Um, when I talked about hydropower, that is true. Hydropower is extremely important. But for our industry, we need cheap and affordable energy for the next 20, 30 years, because we are, we, Austria has no nuclear power. We have closed our last coal plant last year. Uh, and you cannot uh, catch every uh, energy need with uh, uh, hydro and, uh, and wind and solar only. You need something in between. Uh, natural gas is one cheap energy resource that we have used and are using and will be using for the years to come. Um, and Russia, whatever you may think about Russia, but Russia has been a stable supplier for, for decades. Uh, and this is another way of bringing energy into our market. Uh, so we were supportive. Uh, other European countries were completely critical. You know, the, the Baltic countries, Poland is uh, super unhappy. The Ukraine is not very happy about this project. But this is something where we have no dispute any longer with the United States because there were all kinds of extraterritorial sanctions which we thought were uh, 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 completely unacceptable because we can debate about where should our energy come from, uh, but this is a debate we, we have to lead in Europe, and it will not be led uh, by Senator Cruz from Texas alone. Um, just a, a, a sentence about uh, how Austria sees itself and always has seen itself. Uh, the OSCE is one uh, international organization that is headquartered in Vienna, um, it is an organization of some 57 members, and this is the forum where if you want to talk about the Ukraine crisis, that's where you do it. Because it, the OSCE, you have Russia, you have the Ukraine, you have the United States, you have the, the West. We are all sitting at the same table, and this is a forum where that has worked actually fantastically well. Uh, and this is exactly how Austria would see its place to be this facilitator, to be this meeting point where these discussions can take place. Uh, the OSCE is a forum that is uh, uh, extremely important uh, and has its headquarters, as I said, in Vienna. Uh, the United Nations... Uh, in 1955, I said, Austria became a free country again. Uh, two months later, Austria joined the United Nations. And that was very much in the back of the mind. Austria wanted immediately to be a back on the international plane, on the international playing field. We made Vienna into one of the headquarters cities of the United Nations, other than New York and Geneva, with important u uh, units, uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency, and others. Uh, this is something that Bruno Kreisky, the late Bruno Kreisky, our chancellor, invested a lot of political capital and money to have this happen. And to this day, this is in, in Vienna, Austria, and uh, an important part of international infrastructure. Uh, and like I said, Austria likes to see itself as this facilitator. This is a very recent photo for all of the foreign policy buffs among you. The guy to the very left is uh, Mr. Malley. He's the United, Nation, United States Special Envoy for Iran. And this is at the last round of uh, Iran talks in Vienna uh, that was taken in um, June. Uh, well, you know that in between now we had the elections in Iran, the Iran talks are now on ice. We hope that they will be uh, thawed uh, before long. Uh, again, here Vienna has served during the last round of Iran talks and now again as this meeting point where uh, people can come together to discuss complicated issues. I think this is very much how Austrians and Austria would see itself. I spoke about neutrality. I spoke about international relations. relations. This is, I think, where, where Austrians would very much see a, a, a role for themselves. Um, 
I mean, I quoted the piece of Vienna at the very beginning. I said, you know, hopefully we feel will find a new, more fortunate epoch in our political and economic development. Uh, the people who uh, said that sentence at the time, if they would look at Austria where it stands now, when, where Austria stands in its relations with the United States a hundred years later, I think they would be quite happy and rightly so. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ambassador Weiss. We have 10 minutes, 15 minutes for Q&A. Comments? Anyone who would like to take the lead? Nanovic has the tradition to ask a student first. I have Victoria Katarina first, because that was our silent agreement. Then I will have you. <laughs> thank you again. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Your Excellency, for coming here and talking to us today, especially as a fellow Austrian. This was a unique opportunity for me. Thank you. Um, my question is concerning the um, economic relations, and you were talking about the tariffs of 2018, which obviously put a strain or a little bit of a strain on the uh, transatlantic um, relations between Austria and the U.S. And now I'm wondering what the pandemic um, did to this relationship, or what do you think it will, um, what influences it will still play and have, um, considering the restrictions of traveling and um, visas and so on and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. Well, COVID, you know, is, is, uh, we are all in the same boat at the end of the day. Um, the, uh, first of all, COVID had uh, an impact on the economic development, as is fairly clear, but, you know, it hits us all. It's, it's, we are in the same story. Actually, what Austria did is what the United States did during the COVID crisis. Basically, the government took up a lot of money, a whole lot of money, and pumped it into the economy. We basically paid Austrian companies to employ people that they, did, that they couldn't use, just so that they wouldn't let them go and that they wouldn't be unemployed and on the street. Um, so kind of the same recipe. So in that sense, I think we'll, we'll get uh, through this uh, quite well. And the United uh, States economy, we can see now, is uh, starting again quite strongly. Uh, China came through the crisis quite well. The United States has restarted quite well. Europe is a little bit behind, but I think it, it's working out. Again, with the vaccinations, also Europe was a bit slower, but now we're pretty much at, at, at the same point. There was a big European debate about this, uh, the, the vaccination and why some countries did this and did that. At the end of the day, I'm happy that Europe held together. We purchased vaccines together because for all the criticism of the slowness of the European Union, what would have happened to the European Union if one European Union member would have outbid the next on the vaccine market? So basically, the Bulgarians wouldn't have had any vaccines, and we would have had 95% vaccinated. How? What would that do for the European Union? So I think... There we are. We are. We are. We are actually in the same uh, place. What's the problem is still you mentioned the travel restrictions. Uh, Europe has opened up travel for American travelers, uh, and I think it was the right move. Uh, uh, but of course, we get a lot of questions from our citizens. They say, "Well, why is it that Americans can travel to Europe, but I cannot travel to the United States? Isn't that usually done in reciprocity?" And they are perfectly right. Usually, it's done in reciprocity. Um, and the reason why the United States uh, hasn't opened up for European citizens, well, <laughs> uh, different explanations. Uh, it's definitely not the, the COVID rate, because if you look at some countries that can travel to the United States, they have much worse rates than, than Western Europe and the European Union does. I think that the true reason is that uh, COVID gives a possibility for now, for example, in the south of the United States to have uh, very limited travel between the United States and Mexico. Uh, the moment you open up this travel avenue between the United States and Mexico, and now you have essential business traffic, traffic basically only, nothing much more. The moment you open that up, and if you start opening up to all Europeans, to the rest of the world, why would you not open up to Canada and Mexico? Basically, it comes part and parcel. But that would mean that you have a very different refugee or asylum seeker situation in the southern uh, United States. Um, and I think that is one of the reasons why the United States is not in a rush to open up all COVID restrictions at the time being. Uh, for Europe, you know, it's, it's not pleasant. I have 
daily dozens of cases of Austrians, uh, professors, um, business people, and, 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 who would like to travel for this, that, or the other reason to the United States, and they can't. And all I can tell them is like, guys, we just have to hold out a little longer. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you for coming here, Your Excellencies. I really appreciate it. I apologize, I had to run from class. So. <laughs> but uh, my question, I hope you enjoy your time here. My question for you is, uh, regarding administration changes in the United States, you see the two political parties and how different their administration can be, especially in the most recent years. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, with your job, can you talk a little bit about what that means when you have a new administration on, and do you keep tabs on political parties? What does negotiations look like between the divide and in between the aisle? Well, you know, you know the United States better than I do. For me, uh, when I was here in the late 80s, early 90s, I always felt that there was still this kind of working across the aisle mentality. Uh, at the Senate, you had these old grand senators who would always work with the other side. I think some of that has been lost. I mean, you tell me. But uh, to me, it seems that there is the divide has become deeper. Um, which of course makes it also more complicated if the one side comes into the, 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 the White House and then the other side is out. And you know, there's not this much uh, holding hands across the aisle. Uh, for our job, it's actually quite complicated because what you do in the United States is something that we don't know. Uh, in Austria, civil servants run the country. I'm not saying this because my, my boss is, of course, a politician. But civil service is very strong and will stay in their functions no matter what the political environment. In the United States, you have a new government and you do not exchange the cabinet. No, 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 no. You exchange the cabinet. You exchange the deputy secretary of state. You change the assistant secretary of state. You change the deputy assistant secretary of state. And, and that you do in every ministry. So this is, I mean, we're talking thousands of, of changes, which is for us really unusual. It doesn't mean that, of course, the course of the United States changes so much. No, 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 no. I mean, there, of course, things are on track partially. But as far as it's very unusual and it's very hard because you, politics at the end of the day, lots of it is also personal relations. You have to know the people to get some things done. Uh, and if everybody changes, plus COVID, where you basically have the chance to meet someone during a Zoom conference, it makes our job really hard. Uh, and uh, yeah, you said a few months of, of, of before COVID, that's true, that were a few normal months. Um, usually, I think uh, we would have been much quicker to engage with a new administration, with all the players of the new administration, um, but it hasn't happened and it's complicated. Uh, and you know, just these days, I, 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 there was a story, my, my favorite senator, Ted Cruz, you know, Ted Cruz has the hold on, on, on a number of nominees for various positions in the, in the government. And he relates the hold to North Stream 2, which is kind of, really? I mean, it's the United States that makes political decisions. It's not one senator. So to hold this hostage to the, okay, whatever. But, but the fact is, that a number of key persons are not in their positions. And then I read some foreign policy experts who say, ah, it doesn't make a difference. So they come three months later. It's absolutely not true. I can tell you, in this Afghanistan crisis, every day we're talking to the United States, every day there's something that we want to discuss. And it makes a huge difference if there is a U.S. ambassador to Austria. Actually, the, the, the second wife of Ted Kennedy has been nominated to be U.S. ambassador to Austria. She hasn't, of course, gotten a hearing at the, because she's part of the hold. She could make a huge in, impact in Austria if she goes and talks to our chancellor, to the minister of defense. That means something. If you have only, I say, a political secretary making the case for America, sorry, not the same. It does make a difference on many levels. In the United States, you do not have an assistant secretary for European affairs. In these days, you do not have an ambassador to Afghanistan. How does that make the United States better? So for me, this kind of transition is, on the one hand, fascinating, a little bit frustrating, uh, and we'll work our way through it. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? In the, in the back, please, lead in the back.
I uh, just wanted to ask, to clarify, when the countries enter the European Union, how does it impact the country's balance sheet and also the individual balance sheet of the citizens of those countries? Yeah. So you could do a, a slight little review. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it makes a huge change in a country. Basically, for all of the countries, and you can draw a line for Greece, Spain, Portugal, Austria, each and every single country joining, uh, GDP per capita goes up, and year by year, and, and, and strongly so. What it also means is you diversify. I, sh I showed the slide where Germany is our strongest trading partner, uh, naturally so. Yeah, strong economy, uh, same language, whatever. Uh, with us joining the European Union, actually, the percentage of Germany went drastically down. We diversified. Austria developed new markets because of the possibilities that the European Union gave to all of us. So basically, it's, it, it, it adds wealth to your country. It diversifies. And also what it means, oftentimes, it's extremely hard for politics to tackle a monopoly. For example, uh, Pharmacies in Austria. It's a monopolistic business in Austria because a pharmacy can sell this, that, and the other. It's not like in the United States where you can walk into every supermarket and buy this and that and pill and the other. No, no, no. It has to go through a pharmacy. For politics to break up a monopoly is extremely difficult because it will be so unpopular with, with your population. Every pharmacy will tell everyone who comes in and buys their pills every day that those damn politicians don't know what they're doing. It's very, very complicated. And that's true on many, many levels. Within the European Union, you can tackle this situation so much more easily. What it means at the end of the day is that Austrian politicians will take decisions in Brussels. And then if people complain, they will say, well, it was Brussels that decided not mentioning that they really sat on the table, but it allows you to really restructure your economy. Things that hadn't happened until 1995 happened quickly in the years thereafter because now you're part of a bigger system and it can't be Austrian intricacies that kind of decide our markets and that make some people rich and some people poor. You are in a European Union market. Basically for us, it nothing better could ever have happened than joining the European Union, economically speaking. Uh, you know, you lose a little bit of sovereignty, but sovereignty oftentimes is really just a, a headline, not, not much more. Uh, how it makes global Britain stronger, but, but that you leave the European Union, I have never understood. Uh, it makes you so much weaker. Uh, and because of Brexit, just... What made the, United, the Britain so unique also in the United States? Of course, special relationship, history, whatever. But at the end of the day, the most important part was that Britain was within the European Union. You could do European politics through London for the most part. Not only, but for the most part. Well, can't do it anymore. I mean, being in Europe gives you strength, gives you a voice. And you know, in the European Union, the beauty of the European Union is that there are only small countries in the European Union, just some of them don't know yet. <laughs> Thank you so much. There was Jim, Professor Ottison, and then your question will be the last one. So hold this thought. Professor Ottison. Thank you very much, and I join others in welcoming you to our campus. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you mentioned we talked a little bit about uh, travel restrictions. Um, my question is about immigration. So before COVID, um, Austria had very different immigration policies than the United States did. I wonder what you think the policies will be going forward once we get out from the, cl the cloud of COVID and what uh, the immigration policies in Austria and what effect you think those policies will have on the Austrian economy and then also more generally in the European Union. Immigration is a, is a super complicated topic. Uh, when I, uh, the year I went uh, to Israel as ambassador, 2015, was the year when we had this huge refugee crisis in, in, in Europe, and it was a nightmare. Because at the time, basically, what had happened is that pretty much whoever made it out of Syria could get into Turkey, and from there on, 
they could basically walk through the Balkans into Western Europe. That was basically the system. And we had it at the, in 2015. It was just this the crisis where we had thousands, hundreds of thousands arriving. Basically, in Austria, you couldn't, in the eastern part of Austria, you couldn't drive on a highway anymore because it was used as a walkway for thousands daily. And it was like a complete loss of control, and, and it was overwhelming. For, and it is still a, a trauma in, in, in European politics. Of course, for certain parties, it, it was the best thing that could have happened. Uh, because if you're far enough to the right, you can play this up beautifully. But even if you're not to the right, I mean, if you suddenly lose control, if a country cannot control its borders, now things get very complicated and it brought home something that we often forget. What we have done in the European Union is extremely unique. That you would basically allow your neighbor to control your borders for you. This is a huge sign of trust. Basically, think about it. It's basically like the United States would say, you know what? It's good enough if the Mexicans control the border in their south. Good enough for me. Everyone who enters Mexico can come to the United States. Would you ever do that? Hell no. <laughs> but in Europe, we've done it. Basically, we, we, we moved the border to Croatia. So basically, Croatia controls the border. Whoever makes it into Croatia is thereby in Austria, because from Croatia to Austria, it's just a sign that says you are now entering Austrian territory. So we have done, they have, we took this huge leap of faith, and the, the foundation of this faith was suddenly shaken vehemently during this whole migration crisis. And the question was, well, how do we do this and what? And the system is not there yet. It's extremely complicated with our, the, the asylum convention because it could mean that basically you say, you know what, um, if you have entered into Austria through a European country, and that's basically our laws as they are written right now, well, then you have been at a safe place. So there was no need for you to come to Austria. So basically, I push you back to the last safe country. So basically, it all ends in Greece and Italy, right? Because this is the only way you can come into the European Union. Yeah? You come by a boat over the Mediterranean or you come from Turkey to Greece. So basically we leave it all for, for the Greeks and the Italians. Well, that's not exactly super solidary. Uh, and what won't make them very happy. But the, the discussion gets extremely complicated. Uh, how many refugees are you willing to take? How can we divide them from one country to the other? How can we control it? And migration, we are talking, it's, it's always a game of numbers. We can integrate a, a number of people, but only so many. And look at Austria. Where do you think a refugee would go? To a Tyrolean cow village in the mountains? Nope. All of them go to Vienna. All of them go to Vienna, and in Vienna probably to do two districts, because this is the where they feel most comfortable. So if you take 100,000 and put them into a city of 200,000, at two locations, wow, now you have a problem. How do you do that in the school? In a school class where you have 23 students, 21 of which don't speak German as their mother tongue, two only. How many teachers do you need in a class to teach them, to bring them up to? So it's a really complicated uh, discussion, and we haven't solved it. Afghanistan just now brings the question back in Europe as a super divisive topic. Uh, and there are no good answers. We have a, a, a lot of migration in Austria. It's not like we have been able to stop migration. There's a lot of political talk. At the end of the day, there's a lot of migration. And it's a, it's a huge problem for the European Union. And of course, we have in the United States, you are often able to see the strengths of migration. We have seen it in our systems just as well, that it brings a lot of strength to a country, but it has to be managed. I think it cannot, the lesson that we have learned is no kind of happy talk will solve those problems. If you have this issue in the school, what you have to do is you have to bring in for every class two teachers at least, maybe a third teacher to teach them in the afternoon. If you don't do that, you have a problem for the next 50 years. So basically it takes money, it takes effort, it takes politics, and it's hard work. It is hard work for the European Union. No easy answers. Thank you. We take a last question and end with a student. Could you ask a question that allows the ambassador to end on a cheerful note? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the mic, please. Dear Ambassador, thank you for being with us this afternoon. Uh, so throughout your career, you had to resolve many conflicts. And I'm wondering which conflict resolving techniques you, find, you found most useful throughout your career? Thank you. Difficult question. Um, 
you know, yes, I think I think there there is a there is a role for for diplomacy at the end of the day, and I, I think that that is of course the lesson, and that is what every diplomat would tell you, uh, and you know we've seen it. Uh, in, in numerous conflicts, you know, the weapons will get you so far. Uh, and we all know the quote of uh, talk softly and carry a big stick, and you certainly should have that stick if need be. But at the end of the day, you know, you have to talk, you have to understand, you have to understand where the other side is coming from. And uh, because I was in Israel for four years, of course, Iran from Israel looks very differently than it does from the United States or from, from Austria. In a key you, had, you have a bit of more of a luxury of talking about an issue that's a bit further removed. For Israel, it's much more immediate. Uh, but at the end of the day, no matter what the political rhetoric and no matter what the political uh, pocket change that you can make from it, I'm... I'm 100% sure that this is a, a, a question that you cannot solve by military means. You know, maybe some senators, the names of which I will not mention, will, will think that you can bomb Iran back to the Stone Ages, but I don't think that that's the answer. At the end of the day, things are complicated, take hard work, take listening to, and you know, sometimes I think the best technique is really putting yourself in the shoes of the other. Very hard to do. Very easy to say, very hard to do, but I think oftentimes the, the only way that you can move forward. That would be my cheerful note at that the end of That was cheerful, my talk. and you know, putting <laughs> myself in, in your shoes, you have given us a lot, and you need a drink now. Uh, <laughs> let me say thank you to our IT team first before we thank the ambassador. Thank you, I mean, to all those who made the live stream possible and the video recording. Uh, Grant Osborne, Chet, uh, Lex, uh, Chen Lektansky, Mel Webb, uh, one of our co hosts here from the Nanovic Institute, and all my colleagues from the Institute. Thank you so much for having made this possible. Also, of course, this night music. You. And finally, we want to thank our guest of honor. Um, we have a little gift for you. It's, it's not a book and it's not a bottle of wine. Um, so the ambassador had a small walking tour of campus. And I don't know whether you came across the Notre Dame bookstore. Um, it may be a little bit of a misnomer. You have many things in the bookstore, but just a few books. And, and so um, this is a gift from Notre Dame. It's a harmless little thing which you may wear in your professional capacity advertising Notre Dame. Your Excellency, thank you, thank you so much. much for being our guest. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.